All right, hello everyone. So let me make this full screen. Okay, yeah, so what I will talk about is like a way that we have implemented an aspect for how to accurately model phase transitions. And this is work I did with Renee. So Renee did actually most of the implementation for this in aspect. And then with Carolina Lifke Bartoloni and Lars Dixrud. And the motivation for this is that we have known for a long time that phase transitions are important for the style of mental convection. So here on the left, um, you see models from 1992. And the model on the left is one without phase transitions. And then these black lines illustrate the temperature in the model. And so without phase transitions, like both the upwellings and the downwellings, they can go through the whole mantle. So there's a model with whole mantle convection. Whereas this model on the right has a phase transition at 660. And so this phase transition inhibits the flow. So like both the upwellings and the downwellings, they stall at these, like at this phase transition. And so this is a model of layered mantle convection. And today we know that like both plumes and slabs can go through the whole mantle. But we also know from seismology that there are some slabs that stall in the mid mantle. So it's still an important topic to accurately model phase transitions. Um, what we see on the right is another important point, just the influence of the width of the phase transition. So what we see here is the time averaged mass flux plotted over depth. And the solid line is a model that has no phase transitions. And then these dashed lines are models that do have this phase transition here. And the first thing we see is that the mass flux is smaller where the phase transition is. And then the difference between these models is that the phase transition width is different. And the thinner the phase transition, the more the flow is inhibited by this transition. And so it's important to also accurately model the width of this phase transition. And we looked at this in aspect where this is uh, just a simple 2D convection setup from Christensen and Yuan with a Rayleigh number of 10 to the 5. And um, so these two models are basically the same. Um, they all have a phase transition in the center of the box. And the only difference between those three models is the thickness of this phase transition. And so the background colors here show the temperature. These black lines show the streamlines of the flow. And so what we see on the left is that both the upwellings and the downwellings um, go through the phase transition and the model has whole mantle convection. And in this case, the phase transition spends 5% of the height of the box. The model in the center, the phase transition is just slightly thinner. So now it's 4% of the box height. And in this case, we have episodic convection. So some of the material remains in the upper mantle and some in the lower mantle and some material goes through and this also changes over time. And then in the model on the right, um, the phase transition is now only 1% of the box height. And in this case, there's layered convection. So most of the material in the upper mantle stays in the upper mantle, and the material in the lower mantle stays in, in this lower half of the domain. And so that means it is really important to, to model these thin phase transitions. And if we look at the real mantle, this problem becomes more important than just having one phase transition. So this diagram shows phase transitions for a pyrolytic composition of mantle. So we see there are lots of different phases. The phase transitions have a lot of different Clapeyron slopes. Um, the material properties like the density, the thermal expansivity, and the specific heat, they jump abruptly at these phase transitions. And we can also see so this, um, this yellow line. This would be the mantle adiabat for present day for like an average mantle. But if we move this up or down in temperature, for example, in plumes or on slabs or in the early Earth where we would have had a hotter temperature, then it may cross completely different phases. So even the like what kind of phase transition we have, that's, that might change for like different, uh, different temperatures or just different times. And so that means the implementation for like having something like that in aspect has to be flexible to be able to cover all of these things. And there have been a number of different approaches for how to implement these phase transitions in geodynamic models. And these are all also implemented in aspect in like it to some extent. Um, the first approach, the simplest one, is the approach of a phase function, where the phase transition is described by the proportions of each stable phase independence of depth. So for example, using a hyperbolic tangent. And this is the advantage that it's easy to implement. And it's easy to change certain parameters like the Clapeyron slope of one phase transition. However, it limits the complexity of the phase relations 
um, because every phase transition has to be implemented separately by hand. A more recent approach is using lookup tables um, based on like material properties based on mineral physics um, for a range of pressures and temperatures. And this has the advantage that, like we saw on the diagram on the last slide, all of these uh, properties are already automatically included. So we can have multiple phase transitions with a different width, different Clapeyron slopes, and different phases for different temperature and pressure ranges. However, both of these approaches have the disadvantage that latent heat effects cannot be captured accurately if the transition width is not resolved by at least several mesh cells of the geodynamic model. And so if we think about that for global 3D models, the resolution is usually something on the order of tens of kilometers, um, but some phase transitions are only hundreds of meters wide. So this limits what kind of phase transitions we can include in the model or what kind of models with realistic phase transitions we can run. And now I want to go a bit more into detail about what exactly the problem is. So if we think about a very thin phase transition, um, how that would look like in the mantle. So as long as we, so if we look at this in the space of pressure and temperature, um, if we are in the lower pressure phase, um, phase one, um, the mantle adiabat follows a given slope. And then once it hits the phase transition, it abruptly changes its slope as long as material is converted from this phase one to phase two. And then once all of the material is converted, we go back to a new slope um, continuing down into the mantle. Um, but we only have this different slope if we are exactly on this line where both phases are present. If we're a bit further up or further down, then we would have a completely different slope of the adiabat. And so now if we go from this real world problem to the discrete problem in a, a numerical model, then we, we can't have this really infinitely thin phase transition anymore. We have like a, a discrete width of the phase transition and it's both caused by the finite resolution of the geodynamic model, but also the finite resolution of the lookup table, which has, uh, so if we use a lookup table, it has a, a number of points that we have to define. And so in the best case scenario, what happens is that we now just have a phase transition with a finite width. Um, and if everything is resolved, then just the slope of the adiabat within this phase transition changes. But if this is not resolved properly, then we just complete, uh, we just compute a random slope of the adiabat, um, sh should have been a long line here, and the temperature that we come out with on the other side of the phase transition would be completely wrong. And I can show an example of that in aspect. So this is again one of these 2D convection simulations that has a phase transition in the center of the box, um, and it's pulling here and down pulling here. And on left, we see a model where the phase transition is resolved. So this is 6% of the box height. And so then we see what's supposed to happen, which is that there is this temperature jump from the lower half of the model to the upper half of the model across the phase transition. Whereas on the right, the phase transition is now so thin that it's not resolved anymore. So what we still see here, um, this change in temperature, that's from the initial condition, which had the correct adiabat computed. But then as the material moves upwards on the left side and downwards on the right side, we see that either the temperature jump across the phase transition is not computed at all, so there's no change in temperature, or that there's this like completely random, like a, a wrong jump in temperature that's computed here. And we see all of these artifacts in the solution of the temperature. So what we propose as a solution for this and what we've implemented in aspect is to use um, entropy instead of temperature for solving the energy equation. And so what, what I show here in the right is how this, how this problem looks like in pressure and entropy space. So in this case, the mental idea, but now um, it doesn't change its slope anymore because it's just defined as a line of constant entropy. So it's, it's just a constant. And the other thing is that we now have, uh, even if the phase transition is really sharp in pressure temperature space, we now have a region of finite width where both phases are present. So this is exactly where we are along this line and convert from phase one to phase two. And so both of these things make it easier to handle this problem numerically. And so if you want a more accurate and more uh, less hand wavy uh, explanation of this, um, Bob Myhill will write, so he's written a post and I think it will be published on the EGU blog within the next few days. And there you can read more about exactly this problem. And 
So this means now that we don't need serval mesh cells anymore per um, like across the phase transition in the temperature phase. And we can have a look at how um, like in how that looks like in aspect in terms of what equation we solve. So um, this would be the temperature equation, and this would be the equation with the entropy. And so one thing we can see is that in the temperature equation, we have this adiabatic heating term with the thermal expansivity that has all of these jumps in the properties. Um, and this is not included in the entropy equation anymore because it's automatically included in the entropy so that the entropy doesn't change um, along the adiabat. And the other point is that the specific heat, which uh, also had a lot of these jumps, this is now only included in the diffusion term. So it's not such a big problem anymore. Um, otherwise, the structure of these equations is really similar. So we can use the same numerical methods for solving an advection diffusion equation and aspect. Um, however, what we see is that this entropy equation contains now both the entropy and the temperature. And so we need a lookup table to convert between those two. And that's what we use Hefesto for, so um, to have this lookup table. The second ingredient of this method is something that I will not talk about that much today because it has already been published. And I think we talked about it at the last aspect user meeting. And the idea is that for solving the Stokes equation, we now include the full time derivative of the density in the mass conservation equation. And uh, this method describes how we did that without introducing any pressure oscillation, which would usually, usually happen when we include this term. And so this allows it to also accurately model the volume change across phase transitions. So let's have a look at the uh, result and aspect and how, like, if that fixes the problem. So I think back, uh, what we see here on the left was the model where we had all of these uh, wrong temperature jumps across the phase transition. What we see now here on the right is the same model, just using the new method um, solving the uh, equation for entropy. And in this case, we see you get the rate jump in temperature across the phase transition going like both upwards and downwards. And we can also look at some uh, benchmarks for um, using this new formulation. So um, let me start this, and then I can explain uh, what the benchmark is. So it's a it's a 1D adiabat, where um, there's flow coming in here from the top and then going down. And what we see here on the left is the temperature and the pressure in the model. And on the right here, we see profiles for the density, for the temperature, and for the entropy. And um, so if I go back a bit further, we can see what actually happens. So we start from one given adiabat, and then the material that flows in has a different temperature. So it's on a different adiabat, so a different line of constant entropy. And what we see in this top right image here is the black line. That's the reference solution for the density, uh, which is on this new adiabat. And the brown one is the current density in the model. And so whereas in the beginning, they were quite different, as this model evolves over time, the new density approaches this reference solution for the for the density, which can be just computed as like what should the solution be along this one the adiabat. And we also see that for the temperature, so the the temperature jump in the beginning, it was on this lower temperature, but then as the material of the higher temperature is advected into the model, the temperature jump now occurs at a higher temperature, but we still get the correct change in temperature across this transition, which is here in the center of the box. The other thing I want to show is an application model. So this is the mental convection model, and at the top we see the temperature as background colors, and at the bottom we see the entropy. And this model has a really strong and thin phase transition at about this depth. And so what we see here is that because of this phase transition, both the upwellings and the upwelling they get stalled at this phase transition, and it just takes like it just takes some time until the material can go through. So this is a, a bit more of a layered style of convection than we would see it in a, a usual mantle convection model. So to summarize this, um, I've, what I've talked about is a new method that can model very thin phase transition without having to resolve them by server mesh cells, but we can still accurately compute the temperature jump across these phase transitions. And the two ingredients for that is first to solve the energy equation for entropy instead of for temperature, and then second 
to include the full gradient and time derivative of the density in the mass conservation equation. And uh, this is already in aspect, and it um, allows it to incorporate a complex set of phase transitions with all of these different, like a variable clapeyron slope, uh, material property changes, and uh, phases that only exist in a given pressure or temperature range. And so we hope that um, for those of you who, who who want to like who are interested in running models with phase transitions, that you will be able to use that for lots of interesting applications. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, again, since we are a bit behind time, I apologize for that. Um, we'll uh, move the questions to the discussion session in the next block, um, which would bring us now to our uh, first break for today. And um, I would say we are about 10 minutes behind schedule. So I would also say we start the next session, maybe 10 minutes later, um, and have a break of 30 minutes now um, and meet again 10 past the hour. Um, thank you all for being here and uh, see you all in half an hour.